straight to today's market action. A volatile day of trade which saw the benchmark indices ending absolutely flat. The Nifty ended the day with a slight negative bias but did manage to hold on to the 10,500 mark. The Sensex closed without any change. Banking sector was the star performer of the session with the Nifty Bank Index closing up over half a percent. In the currency space, the rupee strengthened on Tuesday's crude oil price cash. The Indian unit ended at 72.31 against the dollar against Tuesday's close of 72.67. So that's the dollar rupee for you. And crude oil, while it has recouped some of the previous session slide, this after reports suggested that OPEC and its partners are considering a higher than expected production cut of 1.4 million barrels per day. The decision on crude production is expected at the next OPEC meeting, which is on the 6th of December. So that's 66.81 on Brent and 56.52, up by about 2% and a percent and a half a piece. But the big story this evening, the Supreme Court has reserved its order in the Raphael case. The Apex Court heard a string of petitions challenging the intergovernmental agreement between France and India to buy the 36 Raphael jet. Sparks flew in the court and one of the petitioners, Prashant Bhushan, clashed with the Attorney General K.K. Venugopal over pricing and the secrecy clause. The government admitted before the court that there is no sovereign guarantee from the French government on the deal and all they have is a letter of comfort. The Apex Court even summoned Air Force officers to hear directly from them instead of officials from the Ministry of Defence on the Rafael deal. Ashmit Kumar, who's been tracking all the developments in court, joins us now. Ashmit, an interesting day of developments, even as the arguments now stand closed, the order is reserved. Take us through what transpired and then what can we expect now? Well, it was a day-long hearing, plenty of clashes, and there were plenty of situations where the government was found searching for answers. We'll take our viewers through them one by one. First up, one of the concerns that the petitioners had expressed was the choice of uh, Reliance Aerospace as the offset partner. Now, this uh, to the petitioners seemed odd. It has zero experience uh, as far as uh, development of sophisticated uh, 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 war machines are concerned, and that this, given the fact that uh, land availability was the only uh, talking point, it appeared to be suspicious to the petitioners as to why Reliance Aerospace was given. Especially uh, since in various interactions uh, in the media, the Dassault chief had said previously that he's comfortable and in fact happy with the association with HAL. And that has been in fact one of the key arguments that has been raised by the petitioners. The second was with respect to a sovereign guarantee. Now, it's par for course in G2G, in government to government agreements for the recipient country, in this case France, to issue a, a performance guarantee of sorts. It is a sovereign guarantee with respect to performance of the agreement in question. Now, the French uh, have passed on the buck saying that they are not concerned with the performance of the of, of, of the agreement in question. It's Dassault uh, that is to provide the equipment in question and hence uh, there is no room uh, for provision uh, of a sovereign guarantee and hence what the government has as of right now is a letter of comfort. That is what the AG presented uh, to the Apex Court that they have a letter of comfort in terms of weightage. It doesn't nearly add up as much as a sovereign guarantee. The third of course was the issue of the DPP itself 2013. Mm. Now the offset partner details have to be made known uh, to the government of India by Dassault as per 7.2 of the DPP of 2013, but that hasn't happened as of yet. Now, this was one issue that the Apex Court grilled the, uh, the government on, the, uh, the Attorney General on. His answer was that there has been an amendment with retrospective effect, which in fact raised more questions than answers in the Apex Court. Now, which brings us uh, to, of course, the road ahead. The judgment has been reserved, but what happens? Mm. Uh, now, keep in mind that as far as the prayers and the petition are concerned, quite bold. It goes on a step further and says that there has been widespread corruption leading up all the way to the Prime Minister. Mm. The prayer essentially that has been sought is a CBI probe, a Supreme Court monitored CBI probe. So that is one question uh, that the Apex Court will now have to tackle after the arguments have been concluded. The judgment, of course, stands reserved. All right, Ashmit, appreciate you joining us uh, with the details of what transpired in this matter in the Apex Court today. Tough questions coming in from the government and the two big headlines, really. One, why was the DP amended retrospectively when it comes to the offset clause and the second headline really is the fact that there is no sovereign guarantee uh, which was admitted by the government today uh, that there is merely a letter of comfort from France to the Indian government as part of that IGA agreement. Now the big corporate story tonight. Z Entertainment, that stock saw some wild swings in trade today and this after Z's promoters Subhash Chandra and family announced 
that they intend to sell up to 50% of their stake in the company. Speaking to CNBC TV 18, Z Entertainment's managing director and CEO Puneet Goenka said that the promoters will not even shy away from selling beyond 50% if someone writes them a cheque that they cannot refuse. Look at the stock today, finally closing about half a percent or so lower. Uh, but as the intraday chart tells you, a fair degree of volatility. Here's Puneet Goenka in an exclusive chat with CNBC TV 18. If it's a strategic partnership, I don't expect it to be a multiple uh, uh, partner deal. It will be one strategic partner that we are looking for. And whoever adds the maximum value to our business will be considered uh, to be our partner. What we have received is a lot of interest over the last few months from uh, several players in the global arena. Uh, these are spanning technology. These are spanning uh, content companies that are, that are spread across geographies. So it's a, it's a mixed bag of all possibilities. We've been seeing a lot of speculation uh, happening uh, off late, uh, considering the promoters' uh, interests and promoters' pledge levels, etc. And speculation is something that I don't like. And hence, we thought to be proactive towards our shareholders, towards our analysts. Are you speaking to Rel Geo? <laughs> I am not at liberty to divulge any names right now. I'm bound by strict confidentiality until, until I can say that. So I can't share with you any names. In the conference call, you said that uh, if someone writes a really big check, you will give away more than 50%. Well, yeah, if somebody writes a check to me, which I can't refuse, why not? It's still worth the effort that I've put in so far. I will find something else to do with my time. Well, that's Puneet Goenka saying that if uh, somebody makes an offer that he cannot refuse, they may even consider offloading uh, more than 50% or exiting altogether. So that's the big corporate development to watch out for. But more corporate news today. Ultratech has notched a legal victory in the race for Binani Cement. The company law appellate tribunal, which is the NCLAT, has ruled that its bid of 7,900 crore rupees is valid. The NCLAT went on to rule that the offer from another suitor, which in this case is Dalmia Bharat, was discriminatory against a few creditors. The Dalmia group has decided to challenge the order in the Supreme Court as was expected. But it's been a day since Flipkart co-founder Binny Bansal stepped down as the group CEO following an independent probe into allegations of serious personal misconduct. CNBC TV 18 learns that the charges of alleged sexual assault leveled against him date back a few years. We also learn that it was only in July this year that the complaint was filed with Walmart. Saina Denugura joins us now with more. Uh, Saina, it's been 24 hours since that development. What more now in terms of uh, the leadership rejig and how that's going down? A day after Binny Bansal stepped down as CEO of the Flipkart Group on allegations of personal misconduct, we learned from our sources that the issue of alleged sexual assault is a dated one as far back as 2016, but a formal complaint for this was filed with a global Walmart team only in July 2018. And while the law firms investigating the complaint haven't found any evidence to corroborate the claims, Walmart had an issue with how Binny Bansal handled the matter in the past. Top company sources now tell us that they were unaware of any investigation ongoing against Pansal till a few days ago. And even then, they didn't think it was of a serious nature at all. Walmart says it didn't ask Bini to resign and that the decision to do so was his own. Bansal's resignation has caused nervousness in the rank and files of the company with a feeling that the Bansal era history is being wiped out. Bini Bansal still holds 5-6% in the company he co-founded in 2007 and as per his statement, he will continue to sit on the board of Flipkart. Now there is also some concern regarding the leadership rejig and the new reporting structure under which Anant Narayan, the CEO of Mintra Jabong, who previously reported into Bini, will now report to Kalyan Krishnamurti. And while sources say that Kalyan has made it clear that any change should not be seen as an integration of Mintra into Flipkart fashion and that it will be business as usual at Mintra, a source within Flipkart tells us that Narayan, the Mintra Jabong CEO, may have his own views on the new reporting structure. Queries to Mintra's Anant Narayanan have, of course, gone unanswered. All right, Saina, appreciate you joining us. Uh, that's the latest in the Flipkart story. But the big interview of the day, two months after the Supreme Court upheld the constitutional validity of Aadhaar, but curtailed its use, UIDAI CEO Ajay Bhushan Pandey has cleared the air on the impact of the verdict. Let me break this down for you. Here are the key highlights. Now, fintech companies and third parties 
can use offline Aadhaar authentication to verify users. The UIDAI CEO says that the Attorney General has opined that such a move is not in contravention of the Supreme Court order. He's also promised that authentication logs will be deleted in the next few weeks, as was mandated by the court. And he also went on to say that telecom companies have sought two to three months to finalize an exit plan on the Aadhaar verification. Because remember, telecom companies were using Aadhaar for verification and KYC. Here's the CNBC TV 18 exclusive interview this evening. The Supreme Court has clearly said in this judgment that Aadhaar authentication, if Aadhaar authentication where you know you put your biometric or you do through your online OTP, you know one time password pin which comes onto your mobile number, if you are verifying the identity through such means, mm. we, we call it an authentication. Mm. So if you are doing through authentication, then there has to be some law. Some law has to be there. Yeah. The Supreme Court has also said that however the individual is at the liberty mm. to use his physical Aadhaar card. Mm. Physical Aadhaar card, you know, because everyone has been given an Aadhaar card. Yeah. Now just imagine that see in our country mm. of 130 crore people, what we estimate is that approximately 50 to 60 crore people will only have an Aadhaar card. Mm. No other ID document which can be recognized nationally. Okay. Right. Yeah. For example, supposing a, a laborer from West Bengal, mm. if he comes to Delhi, mm. and Delhi, you know, he can't get any service on the basis of his ration card of West Bengal. Mm. But what his Aadhaar card which he got in West Bengal, yeah. he can get all the services there. Sure. So what the Supreme Court has done, Supreme Court has permitted use voluntary use of Aadhaar mm. card as such. Mm. So what is the offline verification is, a, on, is, a, is an electronic version of physical Aadhaar card. Okay. So e-Aadhaar is an electronic Aadhaar. Yeah. And electronic Aadhaar can be offline verified. Mm. Offline when I am saying is that it can be electronically verified mm. but without pinging the Aadhaar servers. Okay. So what happens is supposing you know if you take your electronic Aadhaar, mm. go to a bank, mm. banks should be able to verify the digital signature of mm. that electronic Aadhaar, mm. should be able to provide you the service okay. because you know you have volunteered to use your elect yeah. electronic Aadhaar yeah. which is permissible as per the judgment of the Supreme Court. And you have had this legally vetted? That's correct. Oh, you've got the Attorney General's opinion That's on right. whether this is in compliance with the Supreme exactly. Court judgment and exactly. it is. Exactly, yes. Okay, so uh, is this the way out, so to speak, then as far as third party providers are concerned, fintech companies are concerned? How many people have started this process of using this offline authentication? So, so we, we, had a, we had a workshop of all fintech companies because see, ultimately, you know, the Aadhaar is a very, very powerful and Supreme Court also has mentioned that it's an empowerment document. Hmm. As a citizen, as a resident, if I have an Aadhaar, Aadhaar hmm. uh, you know, Aadhaar card or electronic Aadhaar, I should be, it is my free will to use it wherever I want. Hmm. You know, nobody can make it mandatory yeah. unless, until there is a, there is a law. However, I should be able to use it and particularly when, you know, 50 to 60 crore people in India only have Aadhaar yeah. card. Right. So they should be able to freely use it. So what we are doing is we are working with, you know, the various stakeholders the fintech companies because we don't want that the India's digital journey mm. or you know in this journey should get hampered yeah and it should so so what the Supreme Court order that's why we are saying the Supreme, Supreme Court order also told you to put more checks and balances in place to put more safeguards in place since the order since you were talking about this workshop that you've done with fintech companies what are the further safeguards that you've right. put in place? So, so in this phase safeguard I mean, let me explain to you this offline verification how it will work this offline verification, you know, in this offline verification, the, you know, you can go to our web website and you can download one version of Aadhaar card, mm. which where, where your Aadhaar number will be masked. Mm. So your Aadhaar number is not exposed. Okay. Right. It, it has only your name, address and photographs. Okay. Which anyway, you know, in this today's world, your name, address and photograph, it right. is in the voter ID card, mm. you know, voter list. Mm. So the privacy, uh, privacy issues are not to that extent, you know, uh, uh, there. Okay. So if that kind of an Aadhaar card and which is, it is a digitally signed by us, mm. so that can be used by the fintech company, the technology company, any service provider, mm. right, without impinging your privacy and that itself is a very very big safeguard so what this offline verification in fact the justice sri krishna committee hmm. was constituted for the yes. overall data protection yeah. that justice sri krishna's committee also you know recommended this that this offline yes. uh, verification virtual id you know the, these are the certain methods which will ultimately strengthen the data privacy 
the uh, data protection right. and will protect the privacy of Aadhaar and okay. also will prevent misuse of Aadhaar, the Supreme Court in its judgment has, you know, in fact, impressed upon the government mm. to implement Justice Sri Krishna's report. Well, the Rajasthan Assembly elections are just a few weeks away and political parties are shifting to top gear. The Congress has decided to field both its heavyweights, Sachin Pilot and Ashok Gehlot, in the Assembly elections. While announcing the party's decision, the former Chief Minister of the State, Ashok Gehlot, also dismissed reports that there was any infighting within the party's state unit. <laughs> चुनाव सचिन पायलट भी लड़ेंगे मैं भी लड़ूंगा सब लोग चुनाव लड़ेंगे इस रूप में पार्टी चलती है इतिहास में कभी भी आजादी के बाद में राजस्थान में कभी भी कभी भी जितने भी मुख्यमंत्री बने कभी भी पहले कोई फैसला नहीं हुआ चुनाव के पहले मैं कह रहा हूं आजादी के बाद में राजस्थान में कभी भी निकले किसी को नहीं किया गया तो हमारी परंपरा को बनाए रखेंगे हमें वो अच्छी लगती है well, that's Ashok Gehlot and Sachin Pilot both contesting from Rajasthan and more from the state in a setback for the BJP. Its lawmaker, Harish Chandra Meena, has joined the Congress party. He is a member of the parliament from the Dosa constituency and he is now headed to the Congress. And from one pole-bound state to another, Congress President Rahul Gandhi is on a whirlwind tour of Madhya Pradesh. As he crisscrosses the state, he is raising the Rafael issue in most of his rallies to take on the BJP. Pallavi Ghosh is in Madhya Pradesh tracking the Congress campaign ahead of the Assembly elections. Pallavi, what kind of impact is uh, uh, the Congress party making on the ground? What are the key challenges that it faces? Well, if you talk about Madhya Pradesh, the Rafael issue certainly is not resonating on the ground because it's something which most people don't even understand here. There is a sizable anger against the Shivraj Singh Chauhan government and that comes in from the farmers, it's also coming in from the Dalits and many of the upper castes as well. Unfortunately, Rahul Gandhi's focus, Shireen, has largely been on the corruption against the Prime Minister or those Rafael deal. That doesn't seem to connect as far as the crowds are concerned. And therefore, at the local level, you find leaders like Kamal Nath, Jyotra Aita Sindhya, or even a Digvijay Singh largely focusing on local issues because they realize it matters more. So that's the key point in Madhya Pradesh. Rajasthan is one state on which the Congress party is very, very hopeful and confident. And I think uh, because they don't want to take any chances, they've decided that both Ashok Gehlot as well as Sachin Pilot should contest the elections. They want to keep the suspense going. They want to keep the supporters of both the leaders together for the Congress party. But I think at the end of the day, what the Congress party is really hoping for is a win in Madhya Pradesh. Politically speaking, Madhya Pradesh is really critical and crucial. And that's where we are seeing the maximum number of rallies from Rahul Gandhi over here. He's going to be back again uh, in a day or two. Uh, but more than that, Shireen, what the worry is in the Congress party is that when the Prime Minister comes back to Madhya Pradesh with 11 rallies, will that be the turnaround? Because that's where the challenge really for the Congress would begin. Well, that certainly has been a challenge in previous state elections. But Pallavi, very quickly, uh, you know, this business about factionalism and infighting uh, uh, within the Congress unit in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, today, we've heard that even Digvijay Singh is now going to be uh, sort of coordinating the Congress campaign. What's the situation between Sindhya, Kamal Nath and Digvijay Singh now as we move forward? Well, you know, in Madhya Pradesh, the problem for the Congress party has been a problem of plenty. There are too many stalwarts here, each of them having their personal fiefdom, and there's no connect between the, uh, each of them. Initially, they did began, begin by, you know, trying to stay together because that's what Rahul Gandhi's diktat was. But in the last 48 hours that I've been here, I think it's very palpable on the ground. Their supporters work for their neta, their leader. Kamal Nath in his area of Chindwara, uh, you know, Digvijay Singh largely in Raghugarh, his area. Jig uh, Jyotiraja Sindhya is campaigning in, say, Aguna or Gwalior for his supporters. He was missing in action when the program was being chalked out by Rahul Gandhi. I think it's very, very clear over here that, you know, sides have been made, coteries have been formed, and that's certainly not the way to go when you deal with a critical election. All right, Pallavi Ghosh, we'll leave it there. Appreciate you joining us uh, with the latest from MP. The big global story, though. The UK cabinet is currently in the midst of an emergency meeting. This was called by Prime Minister Theresa May to discuss a draft agreement for Britain's withdrawal from the European Union. Remember, the Brexit deadline is only five months away, and not all MPs in Theresa May's Conservative Party are currently on board. So, crucial day for the Brexit agreement, that cabinet meeting underway.
With that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of What's Hot. Thanks very much for watching. Coming up next, equities end a volatile session on a flat note. The Sensex and the Nifty remain unchanged for the day. The mid-cap index also closes flat. Market today talk back takes the action forward. I'll see you in 30 on India Business Hour.